It's a glorious day, 11 years since the church has been established, and uh, God is pastor. I am grateful for his ministry and what he's doing here, but I want to I clear up a rumor before I get started this morning. When uh, Scott was establishing the church going to be the pastor, there was a committee that wanted to talk to him about his uh, biblical views. So they met with Brother Scott and said, um, Brother Scott, do you know the Bible very well? He said, yeah, I know it pretty well. And they said, well, which part do you know the best? He said, well, I know the New Testament the best. They said, what part of the New Testament? He said, the Good Samaritan story. <laughs> so they said, tell us about the Good Samaritan. So he said, there was a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among the thorns, and the thorns began to grow up and choke him, and he said, I will arise. Well, the Queen of Sheba came along and gave him 5,000 pounds of gold and 100 changes of raiment, clothes. Then he got in a chariot, and he drove furiously, he said, but he drove under a big juniper tree, and his hair caught in the tree. And he hung there 40 days and 40 nights. And the birds brought him food to eat and water to drink. And he ate 5,000 loaves of bread and three dishes. Well, one night his wife Delilah came along and she cut his hair and he fell on the thorny ground again. He said, I will arise. So he journeyed off and he came to a cave where he stayed and it rained 40 days and water to my friend. And the birds came and fed. As he began to journey, again a friend came and said, Come and have supper with me. He said, I can't, I married me a wife. <laughs> well, they went out in the highways and hedges and begged him to come in, and he turned on and he came to, he came to Jericho. There was Jezebel sitting on the wall, he said. And he began to, she began to laugh at him. He said, chunk her down, boys. They took her down. He said, chunk her down seven times seven. And they chunked her down seven times seven. And of the fragments that was left, there was twelve baskets full. <laughs> now he said, in judgment, whose wife will she be? They said, boy, you do know the Bible. <laughs> you know the Bible. We, we would like to call you as our pastor and have you as our pastor. And he said, well, I want to ask y'all a question for the Bible. How far was it from Dan to Beersheba? Well, the committee got together and huddled up, huddled up, huddled up huddled up. Finally came back and said, we thought they were husband and wife like Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> and Scott said, y'all do know the Bible. <laughs> well, they wanted to end that little meeting with a prayer. They said, the one committee member, would you lead us in a good spiritual prayer? And he said, sir, he said, now lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And Scott said, Y'all are so spiritual here, I just can't help myself. I want to be with you all the time. Well, as I said, that's just a rumor. I don't know if that's true. That could have happened. <laughs> that could have happened along the way. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. This is Pastor Appreciation Day. and I remember well, Scott, the day when you talked to me and, and there, I believe, was with you about to put the church in South Woodville County. And I thought that was a great opportunity for the gospel to be carried down here. And seeing this church full down here, that was the right decision, brother. We God has blessed the ministry. And uh, I appreciate you having this day for him and Tammy. Uh, I've had pastors say to me, my church never does anything for me. That's sad. That is sad. Churches that can appreciate their pastor bless my heart and it's a blessing to him and, and to Tammy. Verse 20 of chapter 20 says, And how I have liked nothing that was profitable unto you, but have shown you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. And then go with me down to verses 26. Wherefore, I testify to you this day that I am pure of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you all the counsel of God. Go with me over to verses 31. Therefore, watch and remember that for the space of three years I kept, I cease not to warn everyone night and day this generation to hear. I want to talk 
to you today about a servant or a celebrity. Colonel James Irwin tells the story of how when they were coming back from the moon, he and the other astronauts, he said, I'm going to be a celebrity when I get to Earth. We, we'll have instant recognition and it'll be a great time. But as he thought about himself as being a Christian, he said, no, I'm not a celebrity, but I'm a servant. A servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, a celebrity is someone that is famous for events that have happened in their life. And of course, Colonel Irwin had seen those kind of events in his life. He was willing to relinquish them to be a servant of the Lord. As I read of Luke's uh, account of Paul in this scripture, I find out that Apostle Paul, in my mind, would be a celebrity. He was known for his actions before he got saved, you know, how he uh, persecuted the church, how he was on the road to Damascus to persecute folks, how God saved him, but the second part of his life brought him recognition for his preaching, for his missionary journeys, and his his way of bringing the word of God. Paul never thought of himself as a celebrity because he wrote, he said, I'm a servant for Jesus' sake. He knew he wasn't a celebrity because he had heard what the church had said about him. It's interesting what the church says about him. You know, y'all gonna talk about us, me, after this at lunch. Well, I'm going to tell you on Wednesday we talk about y'all, okay? When the pastors get together. So the thing is, we pray for you on Wednesday. Well, the church said his bodily presence was weak, meaning uh, feeble. His speech and preaching was contemptible. That means of no account. They were comparing him to the great Corinthian uh, orators, and he wasn't coming up to, uh, to meet the standard. This is what the church said about Paul. Well, Paul said this of himself. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom. In other words, physically Paul was weak. Mentally he was fearful and emotionally he was trembling. The Baptist church would not have called him. Right? He would not have been called. But the question is, how was he uh, so uh, accomplished and remarkable in the things that he did for the Lord? Well, in our scripture, Paul speaks of, uh, to the Ephesian elders and began to understand why he was so used of God. First of all, verses 20 and 21 talk about his conviction. He was the first, first a man of deep convictions. His message had power to change lives. And he said, the gospel is the power of God and the salvation for everyone that believed it. He knew what it did in his life. And he knew if it could change him, it could change somebody else. His message had priority. Places he would go were from house to house or the king's palace to declare the gospel. His deep and abiding conviction was without Christ, man is lost, and no matter what else he does, he's dying and he's going to hell. That's why Paul's ministry was so blessed of God. He had a conviction people need to hear the gospel to change their lives. Well, there's one thing to have conviction, but there's something else is to have a commitment to that conviction. You know, commitment seems to have been lost today. People uh, will tell you yes, and then they don't do it. And uh, I find that becoming more and more prevalent. Well, uh, a question that could do something else about what his conviction is, Paul was, when he met the Lord on Damascus Roads, asked this question. What, who are you and what would you have me to do? Rome was the most powerful nation in the world. Uh, militarily, you know, financially, whatever. They couldn't have put Paul on the dust in his face. I, I believe they didn't have that power. But the power from on high, when it came down, it put him on the ground. It put him in the dust. What would you have me to do? Who are you, Lord? I'm, I'm ready to listen. He wasn't engaged in conversation. He, he was very serious at this time. He'd never been in this situation before. And after God's call, Paul said immediately, he had to preach Jesus Christ. And more than that, he says, he preached boldly. That's why he said his call to preach the gospel, I am compelled to preach. Woe unto me if I do not preach. So his commitment is, was kept. Conviction, commitment. <coughs> He preached in his commitment. He preached simply. I came not with enticing words of speech of wisdom. 
he preached exclusively, nothing but Jesus Christ and him be crucified. He preached humbly, I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. He recognized the responsibility and commitment and knew he could not face it in his own ability. He learned to depend on God in keeping his commitment. Amen. Conviction, commitment. Those are great things to have in a person's life. But there's one more thing. If you don't have compassion, if you don't have compassion, he was a man moved to deep compassion. He often talked about his tears for those who were lost. For his own people, the Jews, he said, I would, I would be accursed. I would go to hell so that if they could be saved. He said, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is they might be saved. Paul had compassion for souls of men, and he was moved in compassion not only to preach to his people, but to preach on those missionaries to the whole world. Well, his conviction, commitment, and compassion in his ministry made him what he is, as well as he could serve. Well, we are honoring our pastor today, and we're going to compare him to what Paul did and see how things come out. First of all, see a pastor of conviction. Does he have the conviction that the gospel is the only thing powerful enough to change people's lives? Does he have the conviction that all must have the privilege to hear the gospel? Does he have the conviction that the only way to truly know God is through salvation? The answer is yes. 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 He is a man of conviction. His unwavering stance upon the authority of God's word is clear. He not only stands on the word, but his convictions led him to study the word and to know the word. You and I may not agree with everything he says, but the fact that you be thankful for, he's telling you the truth. Amen. Okay? He's telling you the truth. His message has to deal with life and death, saved and lost, hurting and and joy and sorrow. His message has to, yes, he is a man of conviction. He is a pastor of commitment. Paul was persuaded that he was responsible for the souls of men, assume an accountability for them. When the pastor answered God's call to the ministry, he made a commitment to preach the gospel from the pulpit, from public places, from private places, wherever the opportunity came, he would preach the word. He has committed his life to his call. Think about this a minute. He has no second or third uh, vocation. His only vocation is to preach the word. And all consuming force is upon his life when he said yes to God's call to the ministry. He's, he's serving you. And when we talk about our pastor, we know he's one who has commitment to what he's doing. It is to God's word and to us. He is the people's pastor. Be thankful for a man. Be thankful for a man who has committed his life to preach the gospel. He has committed. He has conviction. He has commitment. Does he have compassion? You can have both of those and still not be a great pastor. But these things alone are not enough without compassion. So Paul had compassion. It is seen in his preaching and his talking, his weeping, and his visitation. Everything he did, man, he wanted people to know Jesus. Our pastor is a compassionate man. He cares for the hurting. He cares for the grieving. He cares for the ill. Let me ask you this. Have you ever thought about the hours and the miles your pastor drives to visit someone in the hospital? You know, you can go to Chattanooga. That's not the what. 30 miles, well how many times do you have to go? You have gone a long time. And it costs, costs money to go, park, and so forth. He can be there and still do a message each week. Most of us don't think about the time we spend. By the way, he doesn't know if you're in the hospital if you don't tell him. He is not, he is not so well that he's mind that he can know that you're in the hospital or you're sick. Let him know, let him know. Well. Time spent with him lets me know that he cares and loves you, the people that he's been led to pastor. Through my years, through 32 years, I've had pastors talking about their church. It wouldn't be in a good way. And I wonder, where is your pastor's heart? See, I believe when God calls a man to preach, 
He gives them a pastor's heart. That's why he cares. People say, well, even the wife might say, my man, why are you going to do this? It's my pastor's heart. He tells me I, I need to go, I need to be there. I need to do whatever I can. I've never heard this man talk about anything except in a good way. I don't know most of you, but when I hear a good word from him, I know things are well. Your pastor loves you enough, he doesn't go out and talk about you. You love him enough that you don't do the same, all right? Only say good things about him. I've never heard him say that anything because he has the pastor's heart. Well, you may do something that he may do something that you don't like from time to time. Likewise, you do things he don't like from time to time. But here's the thing. He doesn't stop caring for you. He does not stop caring for you because he has the pastor's heart. Well, as we celebrate today, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, want to, I want you to express your love to him, all right, today. Paul completely described the pastor whose ministry was characterized by conviction, commitment, and compassion when he says, For we preach not ourselves in Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Celebrity or servant? Celebrity or servant? Servant. Servant of God. Called man of God. You know, we meet on Wednesday, and I can say if we meet in that room, that any one of those men, do you know what you're supposed to do? I'm called to do ministry. I'm called to do God's will. Ministry. When I've got 15 to 20 men, and they all can say the same thing, I feel honored to be in their presence. God called men to respond to God's call in their life. Serve it for Jesus' sake. Think about that. Why do you do what you do? For Jesus' sake. For Jesus' sake. We're well, honoring Scott and Hammond today. But I want to I ask you this question. You have conviction, commitment, and compassion. It's the right thing for every Christian. It's not just for the pastor's right thing for every Christian. If you're missing any one of those things, your life's not complete as a Christian. You might need to talk to the Lord about that today and commit to conviction, commitment, and compassion. Three things that make up the Christian life. Well, most God, I am honored to be here today to speak in regard to you and ministry. He's been a great friend and a great person in my in my life and supports the work I do. And so I think we might need to close this way if we could. I want to give you an opportunity to just say to him that you love it. And then okay. y'all watch this film there. It means a lot, yes, not just to him, but to her. It's got old. Let us go to the back door so they can do it as they go out, okay? But uh, 